Here in the United States, we're often brought up and told we don't have propaganda, that we have a hard-charging investigative press, we have this educated, skeptical, even cynical citizenry, and that if there were powerful interests trying to manage and manipulate public opinion, uh, they would be exposed. The reality actually is just the opposite. Academics like Alex Carey and others who've uh, spent uh, their lifetimes looking at how propaganda works finds that it's actually in Western democracies and open societies where you need the most sophisticated sorts of propaganda. And since World War I, thanks to people like Ivy Lee and Eddie Bernays, you know, propaganda has become a business, this business of public relations. Or as one of the firms that has often represented uh, dictators, the Bursa Marsteller firm puts it, um, their business is perception management to manage uh, public perception, uh, public policy, on behalf of their clients, whoever they might be. April 9th, 2003. Throngs of Iraqis spontaneously attack a statue of Saddam Hussein, the face obscured with old glory. Later, the stars and stripes are replaced with red, white, and black, symbolizing the transference of power from the liberators to the liberated. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld describes the scenes as breathtaking. For the British Army, they are historic. BBC Radio calls them amazing, and they were, because the entire event was staged. Years after the operation, a U.S. Army report admitted that the toppling of the Saddam statue had been engineered by a psychological operations group. The document states, Our TPT, or Tactical PSYOP team, saw the statue as a target of opportunity. A week earlier, another psychological operation laid the groundwork for what followed. The script was for a female Rambo turned damsel in distress to be rescued by U.S. armed forces. In the situation that we're, we're talking about here with Private Lynch, uh, as you know, on about the 23rd of March, her uh, 507th maintenance company was ambushed. A number of the uh, members of that maintenance company were killed, a number captured, and a number were unaccounted for, she being one of them. We waited 24 hours to get the cameras there to set up the whole thing to make this this big rescue and the SWAT team goes in to save her and then she becomes an instant celebrity overnight. That story happened the same day that the tanks were rolling into Baghdad. That's the same day that we shelled the Palestine Hotel where the independent journalists were. The same day we blew up Al Jazeera's television station. And killed one of their journalists. Well, what we're getting on the front pages of the papers and in the news is the rescue of Jessica Lynch. So that was a PR substitute story. Toppling the Saddam statue, they got Shalabi's group. The Renning group had actually formed them. The CIA had paid the Renning group to form the Iraqi Congress as a counter group to Saddam Hussein, and they were based here in the U.S. Then they flew them over there and they shipped them into Iraq. They were the ones that were standing around the, the statue as, you know, a tank was used to pull it over. The Renning group had been around. He worked for George W.'s father. And he worked for Clinton, too. His firm, he used to be a public relations press guy for Carter. And he created a PR firm that specialized in the war. The head of the Rendon Group, John Rendon, denies that he is a national security strategist or a military tactician. Rather, he states, I am a politician and a person who uses communication to meet public policy or corporate policy objectives. In fact, I am an information warrior and a perception manager. 
Following the first Gulf War, Rendon was paid $23 million by the CIA to create anti-Saddam propaganda. Following 9-11, he was charged with public relations for the U.S. bombing of Afghanistan. Rendon is far from alone. Public relations has mushroomed into a $200 billion a year industry, with PR flax in the United States now outnumbering journalists. Propaganda has become the primary means by which the wealthy communicate with the rest of society. Whether selling a product, a political candidate, a law, or a war, seldom do the powerful deliver messages to the public before consulting their colleagues in the public relations industry. Colin Powell presents a now typical case. He didn't choose a seasoned diplomat for the position of Under Secretary of State. Instead, he chose Charlotte Pierce, known in PR circles as the Queen of Madison Avenue. Her resume includes successful advertising campaigns for Head & Shoulders Dander Shampoo, Uncle Ben's Rice, and now, Uncle Sam. You see a news show, you watch 60 Minutes or a Fox program or whatever it is, you tend to give more credibility to what you're told is journalism. If an advertisement comes on, hopefully you tend to be more skeptical of that because obviously somebody put an awful lot of money into crafting this slick TV ad and airing it. But what you probably never suspect is that that news story you just watched was also crafted by a company given to the TV station or network with the understanding that they would put their own logos on it, identify it as real journalism, and air it. Colonel Sam Gardner would eventually chart 50 false news stories created and leaked by the Bush White House propaganda apparatus prior to and during the assault on Iraq. Foremost amongst these were the lies that led to the war in the first place. It was not bad intelligence that led to the invasion, concludes Gardner. It was an orchestrated effort that began before the war and was meticulously planned to manipulate the public. In 2002, when uh, the Bush administration was conducting its uh, massive public relations campaign to sell the war, out of Donald Rumsfeld's office in the Pentagon, there was something now referred to as the Pentagon Pundits Program, where literally scores of former high-ranking military generals and admirals and colonels were getting their talking points for their appearances on TV news shows directly from the Pentagon. They would literally uh, go to the Pentagon, be on phone conferences with the Pentagon, travel with the Pentagon, and then go on TV as supposedly independent sources. Although most of them were actually being paid in the private sector because these are retired military officials by defense contractors, and many of them were actually registered lobbyists for military contractors. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest right away when your bread and butter is based on being able to sell armaments and bombs and missiles, and uh, you're supposed to be just a patriotic ex-general giving an honest opinion of what's going on. And even though that's illegal, there's no way to really stop it and the most powerful medium through which it occurred refuses to even report on the scandal you've got just a massive problem and that that's where we're at there were clear warning signs long before the age of the imbed during the assault on serbia under president clinton a report emerged by the dutch journalist abe de vries revealing the presence of psi warriors working at CNN. They derived from the 3rd Psychological Operations Battalion at Fort Bragg in North Carolina. DeVries quoted Major Thomas Collins of the U.S. Army Information Service. PSYOPs personnel, soldiers, and officers have been working in CNN's headquarters in Atlanta through our program, training with industry. They helped in the production of news. What made the Iraq war different were not so much the tactics or even the scale, but the high-tech synergy. It was almost impossible to tell where the state ended and the fourth estate began. One of the things that we don't want to do is to destroy the infrastructure of Iraq because in a few days we're going to own that country. Should the 
they have used so. more? Should they, you know, use a Moab, the mother of all bombs, and well, a few <laughs> daisy cutters? And, right. you know, let's not just stop I, at a couple of cruise missiles. <laughs> the, only Craig, morning, huh? the invasion of Iraq represents a pinnacle of domestic psi war in the United States, an unparalleled integration between public relations firms, corporate media, and military psyops. At the time of the assault, large segments of the American public were convinced that a nuclear attack by Saddam Hussein on their nation was not only possible, but imminent. Soldiers who comprised the invading force were similarly confused, with a remarkable 77% believing that Hussein was responsible for the attacks of 9-11. Many earnestly believed that the mission was to destroy a mysterious group known as Al-Qaeda, while bringing freedom to the Iraqi people. Yet what was actually happening was what the Nuremberg Charter describes as the single greatest crime under international law. The planning, preparation, initiation, or waging of a war of aggression. Seven years later, the results of the invasion are clear. According to The Lancet, one of Britain's most respected medical journals, approximately 600,000 Iraqis had been killed from the invasion as of 2006. By 2009, a polling agency put the number at over 1 million. 4 million Iraqis have been made refugees in their own country. Their entire society is shattered. How did the land of the free and the home of the brave arrive at a place where citizens could be manipulated with such efficiency and on such a massive scale? Our story begins in an unlikely place, a coal mine. When we think of public relations, this is not an image that springs to mind. Yet it was here, at the turn of the century, in the town of Ludlow, Colorado, that PR as we know it began to take shape. From the beginning, it was steeped in class warfare. The conditions that men, women, and children worked under in 19th century America were very much like what we think of now as the conditions in the global south in which 13, 14 hour days were not uncommon. Living conditions were often in barrack-like housing. Children worked right alongside their parents. Those were the kind of conditions, and certainly if you picture what we see in the Global South today, almost slave-like conditions, you can make the comparison pretty easily. Like workers in most other industries at the time, the coal miners in the town of Ludlow were organizing to win basic rights. In 1914, the United Mine Workers Union called for coal companies to grant safe working conditions, tolerable wages, and compliance with state mining laws. In response, a labor organizer at Ludlow was shot to death by gunmen working for the Colorado Fuel and Iron Corporation, owned by the Rockefeller family. Then as now, the Rockefellers were synonymous with wealth and power. William Avery Rockefeller had made a living as a literal snake oil salesman, but his son, John Davidson, had achieved the American dream. His fortune was built by exploiting oil reserves in Mexico and the United States. John Davidson Rockefeller was America's first billionaire, but it was his son, John D. Jr., who would define the Rockefeller legacy in the 20th century. 24 hours after striking workers and their family celebrated Easter, the end came. It became known as the Ludlow Massacre. The strike went on from the fall of 1913 to the spring of 1914, and they still couldn't break the strike. The strikers were living in tent colonies set up by the, their union, the United Mine Workers. 
And in April of 1914, the National Guard, which at this time was being paid by the Rockefellers, National Guard attacked the tent colony. Men, women, children killed many people, set the tents afire. We found the next day the bodies of 11 children and two women who were burned, suffocated to death in that fire. That was called the Ludlow Massacre. A brief glance at events prior to Ludlow reveals that the brutalization of workers in the United States was not an unusual occurrence. Sixty years earlier, in 1847, a nationwide general strike was met with violent oppression by federal troops. Over 30 workers were killed and 100 wounded at the Battle of the Viaduct in Chicago. In 1894, federal troops killed 34 American Railway Union members, also in the Chicago area. The troops were attempting to break a strike led by Eugene Debs against the Pullman Company. In 1897, 19 unarmed coal miners were killed and 36 wounded by a posse organized by a sheriff near Latimer, Pennsylvania. Most of the workers were shot in the back while attempting to flee. The worldview of the great capitalists at the turn of the century can be summed up in the words of William Vanderbilt. In response to a suggestion that the New York Central Railroad should adjust its train schedules to accommodate the public, he replied, the public be damned. But the relationship between the public and corporations was changing. Decades of organizing and rebellion had given rise to a vast network of labor groups with increasing political power. Over time, these included the Grange Movement, the Socialist Party, the Greenbackers, the Populists, and Progressives, and perhaps most significantly, the Anarchist Union, known as the Industrial Workers of the World, or the Wobblies. Following the massacre at Ludlow, soldiers in Denver refused to participate in further attacks against the miners, declaring that they would not engage in the shooting of women and children. Demonstrations erupted across the country. A march occurred in front of the Rockefeller offices in New York City. A clergyman protested outside a church where Rockefeller liked to give sermons, only to be beaten by police. In modern parlance, it was a PR nightmare. Ivy Lee went to work for, among other clients, the Rockefellers. The Rockefeller family, after the Ludlow massacre, hired, used Eddie Lee to manage the public perception around that event and other events. Ivy Lee's specialty was crisis management. Uh, among other things, he's credited with inventing the press release, which, you know, all of us just sort of think of as something helpful. You want to publicize an event, a church picnic, call a news conference, you put out a press release. But at the time, the idea was very radical because what Ivy Lee was saying is, well, we're going to manage this crisis by calling attention to it. We're going to actually assist and help the uh, news media and journalists in covering it. What he knew was that the degree to which journalists became used to and dependent on his services was a degree to which he could actually cultivate and manage coverage. Lee began by waging a disinformation campaign. He put out news bulletins claiming that the two women and 11 children at Ludlow had not been killed by militia, but by an overturned stove. He circulated stories suggesting that Mother Jones, in addition to being a labor organizer, was a madam who ran a bordello. He ghost wrote letters to the governor and even to President Wilson. Lee's techniques achieved little success, in part because he himself had become a highly visible figure. In future, PR experts would learn that their techniques are rarely effective unless practiced in the dark. Yet one of Lee's innovations was epoch making. Upon learning that the Rockefeller Foundation had $100 million set aside for promotional purposes, he convinced Rockefeller to donate large sums to colleges, hospitals, 
churches, and charitable organizations in order to generate positive publicity. He also suggested that Rockefeller Sr. begin handing out money in public and that Jr. appear in staged photo ops at work sites. What Ivy Lee understood was that the corporation needed a makeover. Widely perceived as greedy, tyrannical institutions, corporations needed to manufacture an image of warmth and caring. This was the beginning of the public relations industry. Rockefeller didn't set up <laughs> the Rockefeller Foundation until Rockefeller became very unpopular because of his labor policies. And suddenly they, Rockefeller needed to, to create a good impression. Well, it's an interesting phenomenon that the poor actually give a larger percentage of their income than the rich. Um, I think the rich feel that they're doing more because, you know, giving $100,000 seems like a, a substantial kind of donation. And, um, and, you know, it doesn't matter that they have $100 million. They still think, well, they've done quite a lot. So it's partly a result of this distortion of economic values, and, and it's partly a result of being cheap, you know. I mean, people don't want to give away their wealth, Ted Turner said, because they're afraid their status in the Forbes 400 is going to go down that little bit. So they give it away when it's prudent or when it's beneficial, when they can get some, some uh, display benefit out of it, or when it can give them uh, access to a different sort of social class or a different group that they want to be part of. But, um, but they have a more functional view of their wealth rather than a, a strictly charitable view. Charity and private charity and you might say government charity, that is any, any kind of action that, that sort of relieves people's distress a little bit without changing the system, maintains the system. In fact, that is the way the American system, which is very exploitative and very unfair, that's the way the American system has been maintained for all these, these centuries, really, by giving people a little bit and giving enough people, just enough, to prevent them from breaking out in open rebellion. Today, one of the largest PR firms in the world specializes in the art of crisis management. Burson Marsteller holds offices in 35 countries and has served clients as varied as cigarette maker Philip Morris, chemical giant Union Carbide, and the Monsanto Corporation, a company specializing in genetic engineering and other life sciences. Like the Rendon Group, Burson Marsteller is bipartisan to the core. Its worldwide president and chief executive, Mark Penn, served as Hillary Clinton's key political advisor during the 2008 election. The most disturbing facet of Burson Marsteller is its willingness to work with the world's worst human rights violators. They ran PR for the Indonesian government as it committed genocide in East Timor. They worked closely with the Nigerian government and Royal Dutch Shell during and after the Biafran War in Nigeria. And they helped to improve the image of a US-backed Argentine military junta led by General Jorge Videla. One of their clients in the 1970s was the brutal Argentine junta, which had taken control of the government there and was rounding up dissidents, systematically uh, torturing, beating, killing people, and flying out over the ocean and, and dumping bodies. Not a really good public image. So the Burson Marsteller firm was used by Argentina, hired by Argentina, and went to work for them uh, quite happily under a fab contract to improve the image of Argentina in the international financial community and in the Western press. In some ways, it should not be surprising that public relations has evolved into companies like Burson Marsteller and the Rendon Group. Looking back at the career of its first guru, we find a remarkably similar pattern. Ivy Lee went to work for the IG Farben company, a big German industrial company, and we know now that IG Farben was actually part of the Nazi propaganda inner circle. One of the most effective and, of course, horrifying government propaganda campaigns ever organized 
was the Nazi campaign that continued for years and years under the direction of Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. And I.G. Farben paid Ivy Lee and also paid Ivy Lee's son to represent not just their interests, but the interests of Nazi Germany in an effort to paint the Nazi regime as being a friendly regime. But before lending his expertise to the Third Reich, Mr. Lee would do so for the American government. Along with other experts in the burgeoning field of mind science and public relations, he would engineer propaganda for World War I, not just against the enemy, the Germans, but against the American people themselves. We often talk about the propaganda being relatively recent, but of course it isn't. Even in ancient societies that weren't democratic, especially large states, it was understood by elites that if you don't have the support of the people, you could be in trouble. And so a fair bit of attention was actually given to uh, legitimizing military adventures. I'm remembering here a passage from an old Chinese text, I think it's Han Fei, so it would be about 2300 years ago, where the author of the book says, in general, and I'm quoting now, in general war is a thing that the people despise. Therefore, when a young man is to be sent off to war, his wife, his parents, his family should gather around him and say to him, conquer, or let me never see you again. And this is a very powerful sense of uh, well, first of all, the violence done to that young man, but also um, of the sense that war is disgusting to most people, and it is often not in their best interest, and therefore one needs all kinds of songs and dances, and in this case, uh, you know, threatening the young man essentially with dispossession. You can't return to your family, you can't return home, you'll be disgraced, so honor, security, everything is being played upon here. And it continues. So yeah, national security is one of the most powerful notions in modern times. To swindle, I think, people to do things that are not in their best interest and to support massive military complexes that are not in anybody's interest but that are like cancers feeding on society frequently. Propaganda and persuasion have been around for centuries, eons. But propaganda in its modern sense can be traced to the 15th and 16th century when the Catholic Church was in a tough competition with the Protestants over how to articulate a religious vision for the world. And the reason that I mention this is that it shows that propaganda is about mindset. It's about ideology. It's about hope world view, how people see things, as distinct from an individual policy or whether you happen to like this candidate or that candidate. So that's where the word came from, for propagating the faith. Uh, and that's the way the word was used up until the early 20th century. And then what emerged, particularly with World War I, was the application of this propagating the faith to refer to international affairs, to refer to what a national government would do, a national security policy. saw on the geopolitical stage was a crisis of empires. Empires were disintegrating, they were falling apart. The British Empire seemed extremely strong at that time and yet nevertheless was in a downward phase. It couldn't afford to support its own army, for example. Same with the French, uh, same with the Austro-Hungarians, Austro same with the, uh, with the Russians, the Tsarist Empire, same with the Ottoman Turkish Empire, and so on around the world. 
When that war was underway, most particularly the United Kingdom came up with an office whose specific purpose was promoting the war aims of the United Kingdom, the English, through publicity, through covert operations, through what would today be called dirty tricks, through telling the truth, through a whole number of different applications of information, using information as an instrument of war. And from the get-go, from the very beginning, it was both aimed at the enemy and aimed at the home population. The Creole Commission was the American variant of it. Woodrow Wilson came into office in 1916 with the slogan, Peace Without Victory. He said, what we want is an end to World, to world War I, neither side deserves their support, and the population didn't want to enter the war. In America, 1916 was an election year. The war was the dominant issue. The election campaigns of the parties crystallized the sway of opinion. Neutralism, the profound wish to stay out of the war, still possessed a doughty champion in the president. Support for Wilson's policy was strong in the Middle West and Pacific states. Europe's war seemed more remote there than on the Atlantic seaboard. At the Democratic Convention, Wilson was renominated presidential candidate. The chairman opened his speech with a text from the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Within a couple of months, Wilson was talking about uh, victory without peace. And you had to somehow drive the population into accepting this sharp change of policy, the opposite of what they voted for. And that's where the Creole Commission came in. George Creel described his work with unabashed enthusiasm. It was a plain publicity proposition, a vast enterprise in salesmanship, the world's greatest adventure in advertising. 75,000 civil leaders, known as Four Minute Men, were assembled to deliver pro-war messages to people in churches, theaters, and civic groups. Periodicals were sent to 600,000 teachers. Boy Scouts delivered copies of President Wilson's addresses to households across America. It was, in short, the largest wartime propaganda campaign in the history of the United States. Central to the committee's propaganda were two basic ideas. One, the American homeland was in imminent danger from a savage, bloodthirsty foe. And two, it was the fate of the American nation, in President Wilson's words, to make the world safe for democracy. The first theme was a time-honored tactic long used in the United States and other countries to vilify foreign enemies, indigenous peoples, and slaves. During the Great War, the savage Indian and the subhuman Negro would transform into the barbaric Hun. of the bloodthirsty Hun was bolstered by a series of fake news reports leaked by the new propaganda industry and disseminated to the public. Among them, the babies in Belgium had had their hands cut off, were being impaled on bayonets, and in one case, nailed to a door. That a Canadian had been crucified by German soldiers, and that dead bodies were being boiled down in so-called corpse factories to be used for ammunitions and pig food. In a foreshadowing of the Freedom Fries incident, sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Cabbage. False atrocity stories would become a staple for nations in wartime throughout the 20th century. The recent example occurred prior to the first Gulf War. While I was there, I saw the Iraqi soldiers come into the hospital with guns. They took the babies out of the incubators. 
took the incubators and left the children to die on the cold floor. As it turns out, the massacre of babes never occurred. The young girl was actually a member of the Kuwaiti royal family and had been coached by the public relations firm Hill and Knowlton to give persuasive false testimony. Kids in incubators, and they were thrown out of the incubators so that Kuwait could be systematically dismantled. The attempt to engender hatred against Germans in support of the war effort was highly successful. But there was another, equally important aspect to the domestic propaganda campaign. If every adventure story needs a villain, it also needs a hero. Now this is a song made about when there's a draft in the men. Uncle Sam say he traveled east and traveled the west. Uncle Sam say he believe he know the best. Uncle Sam said, Uncle Sam said, Uncle Sam said, you got to buy the love and go. I'll travel the east, I travel the west. Creel estimated that 72 million copies of 30 different booklets about American ideals were sent across the United States, with millions more sent abroad. In addition to influencing the minds of Europeans, the goal was to redefine for the home population the very concept of what it meant to be American. The new American would not interpret events from what Creel called a class or sectional standpoint, but rather as a unified collective. In this manner, the people could be herded into one white-hot mass instinct. Previously, military action by the United States had been justified under the pretense of maintaining order, protecting American interests, and bringing civilization to the savages. Now, the word civilization would transmute into democracy. You don't have to hesitate on the sound say. You got it by 11 go. Next number is called 192. I'm sound say you don't come going to talk. Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian communications theorist, once said that if a fish could talk, and you could ask a fish, what's the most obvious element of your environment? The last thing that the fish would say would be water. That's the last thing the fish would notice. And it's true about any culture. Those things that are most powerful and most obvious to an outsider don't get seen by the people swimming in that water. Americans is God's chosen people. This goes back to, as far as back to 1630, where John Winthrop on the Arabella, coming from England to the United States, said, we're a city on a hill. It's not an accident that in the campaign, you know, debates and stumps of uh, the recent candidates, yet Obama, Barack Obama, actually saying that, we are a city on a hill, as well as Sarah Palin. Ronald Reagan said it in his inaugural address. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds, living in harmony and peace. We're a city on a hill, and so our mission is to democratize the rest of the world. We've got the best system possible, and basically people ought to pay attention to us, because we know. The idea of a particular state cast as savior of the world would be taken to new heights in the United States. But it wasn't an American invention. The savior motif was used as a justification for virtually every imperial intervention during the colonial era. French leaders spoke of a civilizing mission in their new colonies. British leaders spoke of bringing progress in civilized government to India. Imperial Japan spoke of unleashing an earthly paradise in Asia, while the Third Reich dreamt of a worldwide utopia. A decade before World War I, Mark Twain stated that my kind of loyalty was loyalty to one's country, not to its institutions or its officeholders. Decades later, 
George Orwell came to a similar conclusion, that patriotism is a devotion to a certain place and people, contrary to nationalism, which is inseparable from lust for power. This concept of patriotism remains elusive. Once the war against Saddam begins, we expect every American to support our military, and if they can't do that, to shut Equating super patriotism with militarism, military endeavor, military achievements, military struggles and victories, that's all supposedly a special manifestation of super patriotism. And I argue that a real patriot wants something different for his country. He wants social justice, he wants peace and stability, he wants fairness, he wants an end to racism and sexism. He takes pride in his country's ability at social betterment rather than his country's ability to invade and knock around other countries. A real patriot feels an attachment to his country, but not at the expense of other countries. He or she may feel a special attachment to the history of his own country. He values the accomplishments of his country, like the abolition of slavery, emergence of collective bargaining, and the rights of working people for a better life, the gains made by, by women in terms of being able to get into public life. These are the kind of things that the real patriot would value. In October 2001, George W. Bush signed into law what civil libertarians characterized as an all-out assault against the Bill of Rights. It was called the Patriot Act. During the Great War, similar bills were passed. The Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act, passed a year later, authorized huge fines and lengthy prison terms for anyone who obstructed the military draft or encouraged what was termed disloyalty to the state. The sweeping legislation was quickly put into effect. And first on the list were the Wobblies. In many ways, the Wobblies were the most impressive example of a union movement in the history of the U.S. working class. Wobblies was the nickname for an organization called the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW, which flourished in the first decade and a half of the 20th century. The American Federation of Labor, which was the main craft union at the time, refused to organize African Americans, immigrants and um, women workers. So that meant excluding the vast majority of the working class from the union movement. Along come the Wobblies and they set out from the beginning specifically to organize immigrants, women, African Americans alongside white workers in what they called one big union. They led some of the most successful strikes. One of their strikes was the first sit down strike at the time. Women workers played leadership roles, something that was absolutely unheard of at the time. Their philosophy was a revolutionary philosophy. It's known as anarcho-syndicalism. A federated, decentralized uh, system of free associations incorporating economic as well as social institutions would be what I refer to as anarcho-syndicalism, and it seems to me that it is the appropriate uh, form of social organization for an advanced technological society in which human beings do not have to be forced into position of tools, of cogs in a machine. On September 5th, 1917, Federal agents raided offices of the Wobblies across the nation, leading to arrests for the offense of causing insubordination, disloyalty, and refusal of duty in the military and naval forces. 101 of the defendants were found guilty and received prison sentences up to 20 years. Wilson carried out a brutal uh, uh, internal repression 
called the Red Scare, which is the worst in American history, far worse than McCarthy, far worse than anything that's going on now. Uh, they arrested thousands of people, smashed the labor movement, heavy constraints on free expression, threw lots of people in jail, you know, expelled all sorts of people from the country. Yet what had started as a hunt against radicals soon spread to every corner of American society. Patriots were encouraged to inform on friends and neighbors who spoke out against the war, while surveillance increased dramatically, not only by the military, but by seemingly benign institutions like the postal system. The state flourishes in time of war. The state goes stronger in time of war. The state accumulates power. The military is enhanced. The forces of repression are enhanced. War is an opportunity for the government to grow in power. By the time the war ended, the total number of deaths had reached approximately 9.7 million soldiers, with millions more suffering life-changing injuries and severe post-traumatic stress. To what end was not clear. The massive bloodshed had not made the world safe for freedom and democracy. What it had done was produce enormous fortunes for a handful of corporations and banks, while leaving the worldwide labor movement in disarray. If the Great War had been a test of the Constitution, and the concept of balancing the powers by each other, it failed. The United States Supreme Court, established in Schenck v. United States and Abrams v. United States, that the federal government could suspend constitutional rights when the nation faced, quote, a clear and present danger. Randolph Bourne, speaking of the Great War as a whole, responded preemptively with a now famous dictum. War, he said, is the health of the state. Uh, the definition of uh, polyarchy that we have in the social sciences is a system where the participation of masses of people is limited to voting among one or another representatives of the elite in, uh, in periodic elections. And in between elections, the masses are now expected to keep quiet, to go back to life as usual while the elite make the decisions and run the world until they can choose between one or another elite another four years uh, later. Uh, so really, polyarchy is uh, a system of elite rule and the system of elite rule, which is a little more soft core than the type of elite rule that we would see under a military dictatorship, for instance. But what we see is that under a polyarchy, the basic socioeconomic system does not change. It does not become democratized. Wealth is not redistributed downward. Uh, you don't see a more equitable redistribution of wealth and resources. So that's the key. Economic, di socioeconomic dictatorship and free elections. That's the prescription for polyarchy. Participatory democracy would see not only more participation of people in the running of their daily affairs, but it would see a, part a democratization of the economy, a democratization of social relations. In the 20th century, you can't really talk openly about rule by the rich. That doesn't sound nice. The devices that have been developed, propaganda devices, are uh, 